are going to have to get tough. And I mean, damn tough because these people are no joke. They go through basic intermediate advanced training and they are fighting for survival every day. I wish you could sit down with me and one of them and listen to them talk. The words they use are, we are at war. Now that's their perception. I don't care what anybody says, their perception matters because they're training every day. They're engaged in battles every day. I just got off the phone with Lieutenant Chris Olivetis. You may be familiar with him. He's, he's the Texas Department of Public Safety's public information officer. And we stormed with the Texas Rangers last week, an island known as Fronton Island. It is ground zero for the most violent region on the southwest border. And it's 170 acres. And the reason we stormed that island is because we were taking it back from Cartel del Nordeste, who was using it to move everything from improvised explosive devices, weapons south, guns south, but also to use it as a sanctuary to move methamphetamine and fentanyl and cocaine into the country. How can I help? How can I be useful in ending needless suffering? Do not be afraid of work that has no end. We have to organize a social movement. We have an opportunity to lead by example versus just talking hot air. I think the more people in this fight, the more we grow. Eventually, you could change. You know, the people are the ones that can make the change. Welcome back, everybody, to Change Agents, an ironclad original presented by Montana Knife Company. This episode is part of our special series, Narco Wars, where each week we're going to be taking a look at the threats that cartels pose to the people of both Mexico and the United States and how they can be stopped. My guest today is Jason Jones. Jason is a border expert with over 25 years of experience working on the U.S. Southwest border and is a retired captain from the Texas Department of Public Safety's Intelligence and Counterterrorism Division. He has supervised numerous human intelligence, also known as human operations, in multiple nations and then led the longest 24-7 border operation in Texas history, Operation Secure Texas, which was a border security effort between the Texas Department of Public Safety, the Texas National Guard, and federal law enforcement. Jason spearheaded investigations targeting Mexican cartels' leadership and collaborates with the U.S. intelligence community to save both Mexican and American lives threatened by cartel violence. This summer, he testified before the House Homeland Security Committee about the radical evolution of Mexican drug cartels and the dangers that they pose to the people of the United States and Mexico. And you can watch his five-minute testimony. There's a link to it in the show notes. You know, you spent over 25 years essentially working for and with the U.S. government. Did you get to a point where you felt like you couldn't do anymore and you actually had to leave that job so you could tell the truth and and speak the way that you wanted to? You know, it wasn't that. It wasn't it – was, it was that I was a hub in the middle of a wheel that wasn't going anywhere. You know, I, it was like I was banging my head against uh, against the wall. What I'm known for in the community is not the best of the best when it comes to the cartels. The best of the best are some of my closest friends. What I'm known for in the community is bringing everyone together. I was a captain in the Intelligence and Counterterrorism Division. I moved nine times across the state of Texas, a lot of that time along the U.S. South, southern border. I was a trooper in El Paso, Texas. I was an undercover narcotics agent in Brownsville, Texas. And then I was a lieutenant in Laredo, Texas, um, over two major drug squads as the war, as the cartels call, called it, uh, began between the Las Zetas, which at the time were the most hyper-violent cartels in Mexico, and Cartel de Gafo, uh, also known as CDG or the Gulf Cartel. And then I went to headquarters, and I was a captain there. And um, what I realized very quickly is that we were failing on every front and that we were up against something that was absolutely spinning so rapidly out of control and that we couldn't do it alone as the state police in Texas, local law enforcement, no way they could do it alone. And even combined, it was bigger than all of us. And so we were gonna have to work with all of the US intelligence agencies, work with Mexico and truly do precision led intelligence operations to try to help rescue these migrants who are being killed and slaughtered by the Zetas. And uh, that's what I'm known for is trying to bring organizations and people 
and try to stop this problem. And when that failed, when that when that didn't accomplish it, I was eligible to retire. I punched out, and then the rest is history. That's when I went public. And if you would have told me when I retired in 2016 that here we'd be seven years later and things would be where they are, I would have never believed it. I would have never believed it. And that our media was as corrupt as they are on so many fronts won't tell what's happening. I'm still surprised by it. I, I, it's still difficult for me to wrap it around uh, around my mind. Do you think that the government actually wants to solve the problem? I have briefed a lot of people in the United States government from U.S. intelligence agencies. I've been to the agency, worked closely with them. I briefed General Flynn when he was a three-star at the Defense Intelligence Agency. Uh, in his office on the cartel. So we had a great relationship with the Defense Intelligence Agency. Um, everyone at the Reagan building, DHS headquarters, undersecretaries. But what I found out of Washington at the time before I retired is different than, than the way I view it now. At that time, it was, Jason, we hear you. We want you to know that we hear you. And we see it in the classified reporting. What we don't see it in is the data. And what I learned at that time is that they weren't lying and that all of us in the South weren't lying. What had happened was the reporting system was fundamentally broken in the United States government. So from 1934 to 2021, we leveraged a system under the Federal Bureau of Investigation known as the Uniform Crime Reporting System. And it captures eight index crimes, murder, homicide, manslaughter, forcible rape, burglary, theft, and I'm missing one. And for the most part, you say to yourself, well, hell, that kind of covers it. But when you look at what we deal with within transnational crime, and where as a nation we have failed tremendously, it is in everything that you and I are talking about here. Drug trafficking. Can you believe we've been involved in drug trafficking for over 60 years and amongst 18,000 law enforcement agencies? That we still cannot tell the American public how much dope is seized or not seized amongst local, state, and federal law enforcement. Massive failure. Human smuggling, human trafficking, weapons trafficking, drug trafficking, extortion, my God, I can go on and on. And so if as a nation you can't get the little things right, you're never going to get the big things right. And that's where we really were. Now, fast forward where we are today, I think we're in a different model. Everyone knows it's totally broken, but ideology has taken over. And if you look at what's happening, you know, in the current administration, I try to stay out of politics as much as I can. But if you look yeah, at the current way. thing, millions upon millions upon millions of people coming into the country, whether you agree with with migration, whether you don't, whatever your, your view is, where I am coming from is what is going to happen to the American people. I know these cartels very, very well. They do not have more to lose stamped on their forehead. These when you when you think of what a cartel is, how they operate and how they're operating with state actors and non-state actors, every American should be scared as hell. The problem, though, is they're not being told how organized they are. And what I have learned, I briefed a lot of senators, a lot of congressmen trying to get the foreign terrorism designation. That's what I've been all about, to try to get new authorities beyond law enforcement. I'm the guy that started that in 2016 when I retired, is that they truly don't know. That's where we are. Uh, most of the Republican Party elected officials tell me, because it's the very first question I ask now, when was the last time you were briefed, either classified or unclassified, by federal law enforcement or U.S. intelligence agency? You'd be stunned what I'm hearing. They can't get briefings. Really? If they were briefed, it was, oh, yeah. If they were briefed, they were briefed by somebody that hadn't worked the border in 10 years. Most of their intelligence comes from Fox News. That's the right. Now, if you're on the left, it's CNN. So there's the polarization now has really broken the country. And what I'm trying to do is I, I live by just a, a very simple motto. I illuminate it to eliminate it. If I don't have to sell the border, I don't have to sell what the cartels are doing to people in Mexico, with migrants, with our own citizens. I just have to show it. And if, if I can just reach the American people, this shit sells itself. But the problem is getting to them. That That is the core problem we now have. Because media who holds the chains are not going to show those on the left what's really happening. Those on the right, many of them don't even know what to show. Some do, and those are where I go, and I do everything I can. But the problem is you become where you're preaching to the choir almost. 
and the goal is to reach those other people who can't get it. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, that's a challenge given the world that we live in where you're bombarded with information every single day. People get really siloed too and following the sources that kind of give them the theme or narrative that they they believe in their own personal ideology, whether it's from their upbringing, whatever it is, they get really trenched into those systems and they don't want to hear uh, information from other people, whether it's a legitimate source or it's a, a guy standing at the border with his camera trying to just show his personal experience. It's almost as if there's a resistance to, I mean, I don't want to say the word truth because I understand that, you know, people have a their own version of that, but let's say the reality on the ground. I think that's well said. And then, and then let me add a layer to it. Now add the fact that you're dealing with children who are being brought into debt bondage by the Gulf cartel, literally so emboldened that they're putting wristbands on men, women, and children. I broke that story in February of 2021. Never seen that before. Now you overlay that with all of the other problems that we're seeing you know, the fentanyl crisis, the, it, it, it's almost too much that people don't want to bear it, so they turn away. The problem is this. You can turn away all you want, but this monster is coming, yeah. and it will get much worse. And, I, and, and for the folks watching, as somebody that has built programs to go after these cartels and is trying to get and change the United States government to literally change multi-million dollar and sometimes billion dollar programs to focus – the whole entire Homeland Security enterprise on this problem, I'm doing it for a specific reason. When I started this, we were just under 60,000 overdose deaths, really poisonings from fentanyl and other drugs in this country. We're now at 111,355, according to the latest CDC data that came out from April of 22 to April of 23. If you think this is going to stop, I want to be extremely, extremely clear. All you have to do is look to Mexico, just south of me, 100 miles. <laughs> From where I'm sitting right now in Texas, it's coming. And and if you wonder how bad, look at what's happening in Mexico with first, second, third, and fourth generation armored vehicles, completely going from an organized crime into a parallel government. If you think 111,000 dead Americans is the end game, let me tell you, that's just the beginning. Because as they weaponize fentanyl, they went from regular fentanyl to parafentanyl to serafentanyl, and now do we, what do we see? The mixing of xylazine categories into it. And there's a whole nother set of zine categories coming online that Americans aren't being told by the Homeland Security Enterprise. So I will say it again and again. If we do not focus on these cartels, get ready. Get ready. If we continue to attack the symptoms of everything you've not talked about, drug trafficking, weapons trafficking, money laundering, this adjustment from smuggling to the trafficking of people, domestically, yes, we have to challenge that. But if you don't go after who the problem is, which is these cartels, and crush their labs – you're just seeing the beginning because we are one economy of them. One, it's not a U.S.-Mexico issue like you're always told in the news by these so-called experts who've never even debriefed a cartel member or know any damn thing about them. Sinaloa is in 54 countries around the world. Cartel Jalisco New Generation is in over 48. They're the most hyperviolent in Mexico. This will only get worse. And I'm not trying to scare everyone. I'm telling you as somebody that knows them very well and who has warned and warned and warned that this was coming. I think we should be trying to scare people at this point because I don't know what else is going to get them to pay attention. I mean, I, so I live in northwestern Montana, about 60 miles as the crow flies from the Canadian border. And I'm friends uh, with young God's country. Yeah, for sure. But we have a large Mexican fentanyl problem up here. Our source cities are on the west coast of the United States um, coming up, you know, through Tijuana up the western coast. And I talked to my law enforcement buddies and we have a, a couple source cities, but the fentanyl, which is impacting people here, it's almost impossible now to encounter somebody who doesn't at least know in their personal life or one to two to three degrees of separation of somebody who has had an accidental overdose of fentanyl. And I, and I hear it from the law enforcement friends I have here, 60 miles from Canada, but that's not where it's coming from because it's easier for them, the, the porous southern border. That, I mean, it's touching the northernmost points of the United States. And again, I don't know what it would take to get people to, to, to pay attention and then take action on top of that. Maybe scaring them is the last thing that we have. It might be the last tool in, in our tool belt that we have. You know, you guys in the North, you've got a whole nother problem. And that is that the Canadian Canada allowed for uh, Mexican citizens to, to come into Canada. And so as a result of that, you're seeing a lot of the fentanyl coming from the North as well. So what they're doing is they're just flying it over the United States now and then bringing it South that, uh, 
that's one of the big problems. But I, I, I look, I, I couldn't agree with you. I mean, look, people do need to be scared, but they also need to be scared in, in a really, they need to have the information and, and tools to understand what's really taking place. I, I just believe that to the core of who I am. If people know what's happening and how bad this is and what they're really up against, let's be honest. Most Americans think when I talk about the cartels, I'm talking about a bunch of drug traffickers. Drug trafficking today to the cartels is something they do. It is not what they are anymore. You know, they have entire enforcement wings. We watched them go in 2006 from organized crime. This is when the Calderon administration began leveraging their military to go after them. And we watched them go directly into an insurgency. You know, I was dealing with six, eight, and 10, and 12-hour gun battles involving everything from 50 caliber belt-fed machine guns, 40 millimeter grenades, RPGs, and light anti-tank weapons, and hand grenades with these first-generation armored vehicles. And the whole country was looking to the Middle East. And we're watching Mexico erupt in violence. And at the time, everyone was screaming, you never use your military domestically um, because we were looking at our how we operate here. What we didn't realize though, was how strong these cartels had become, how they had leveraged military-grade weaponry from Central and South America through corrupt armories, and how they were corrupting the highest levels of the Mexican government. The United States intelligence agencies had failed tremendously. And so when you hear me say things like, what we're really witnessing in Mexico and at the U.S.-Mexico border is the largest U.S. intelligence failure since 9-11. This is why I'm saying it, because then we fell right into terrorism in 2010 when the Zetas began conducting mass executions. I weren't the first execution, mass execution of 72 migrants. Think of this for a second. 72 migrants in San Fernando. For all your viewers that are watching it right now, Google that. Take a look at that. That's just south of where I'm at, just south of Brownsville, Texas. If you look at the uh, 300 men, women, and children of Allende, Mexico, who were killed by the Zetas, massacred, and then guisoed. Guisoed means is where they, they cook them. Yeah, you hear a lot of them being cooked in acid. That's, that, yes, that's happened, but the real truth is they cut your head off, your arms off, cut you at the joints, cut you at your knees, and then cook, a, cook you in a barrel with diesel, get it up really high in temperature, and just cook you to ash because they have a saying, you can't count a body that doesn't exist. Look at the 50 plus people who died in Monterey at the casino attack, all because they wouldn't pay Miguel Trevino, who was the head of the Zetas at the time, the PISO of the tax. So we were living in that world of terrorism. They've gone far beyond that. And then in 2015, when the President Nieto at the time launched Operation Jalisco to go after El Mencho, who was the head of the organization of CJNG, one of the fastest rising cartels. And he literally shot their helicopters out of the sky once they came in over the Sierras. This is where we then went into a parallel government where we see them today. So the problem that we really have is Americans aren't told. The Homeland Security Enterprise, you know, we, we've become so focused on the left and we've been so focused on the right. We haven't looked at the massive amount of failures of the Homeland Security Enterprise. This is why we created NORTHCOM after 9-11. This is why we created DHS after 9-11. And yet they have told the American people nothing about what these cartels are really doing. And mostly it's become so political. They want you to think they're still criminal cartels as they have gone so far beyond that. So, you know, from my standpoint, I'm a big believer. Look, if we if we illuminate it, this is how we're going to eliminate. And this is truly how we're going to fix it and get the tools and authorities we need to fix it. You know, it's interesting to hear you talk about these multi-hour gunfights with very modern weapons. I mean, the, the things that you described were exactly the same things that we were issued in the U.S. military. And I think people are so used to or conditioned to, and it's a terrible thing to be conditioned to seeing on the news, especially at the height of Iraq and Afghanistan, hearing about battles like that. And it's, oh, it's in a country across oceans. You know, it, it, it right. I guess it piques your attention for a little bit, depending on who you are. Maybe you have a family member involved in that and you follow it a little bit more closely. But what you're talking about sounds like the same level of kinetic activity that we were encountering in Afghanistan and Iraq, but we're just talking about one border south of the United States. If people don't realize the the cascading impacts of that and the impact that they could have on this country, man, you are not paying attention. Man, I, I, hats off to you. I mean, that hats off to you and well said. And now let's compound that. We just opened the borders, not to U.S., Mexico, Central and South Mexico, to the world. We've apprehended a people from 163 different countries 
just the last 10 months alone in fiscal year 23. So think of that for a second. All of the state and non-state actors that are now coordinating at a whole new level that these cartels didn't have access to that now they do, from long haul smugglers to the alien smuggling organizations to the cartels to the Halcon Network, which have operational control of our board. We are at a we are at a whole new level with network analysis, network theory than we ever were prior to 9-11 and then in the, in the decade afterwards. So we have a whole new set of challenges. But with that being said, don't let anybody tell you for a second this is infixable, but I will tell you this, we're going to have to get tough, and I mean damn tough, because these people are no joke. They go through basic, intermediate, advanced training, and they are fighting for survival every day. I wish you could sit down with me and one of them and listen to them talk. The words they use are, we are at war. Now, that's their perception. I don't care what anybody says. Their perception matters because they're training every day. They're engaged in battles every day. I just got off the phone with Lieutenant Chris Olivetis. You may be familiar with him. He's he's the Texas Department of Public Safety's public information officer. And we stormed with the Texas Rangers last week, an island known as Fronton Island. It is ground zero for the most violent region on the Southwest border. And it's 170 acres. And the reason we stormed that island is because we were taking it back from Cartel del Nordeste, who was using it to move everything from improvised explosive devices, weapons south, guns south, but also to use it as a sanctuary to move methamphetamine and fentanyl and cocaine into the country. So we surge with them. As we're getting ready to hit the island, shots are being fired on the mic side. Mexico side, I want to say mic side. So we launch drones, we get them up, and we surge with, with their SRT, and we take the island, and then they, they, they hold it. Where I'm going with this is in this region, Cartel de Gapo and Cartel de Nareste, formerly known as the Zetas, now known as Cartel North of the Northeast, the Northeast Cartel. They have been at war for two and a half years there. And since we took that island, the reason I bring up Chris Olives is because they've been receiving gunfire from 2 o'clock to 4 a.m. every night. They've had rounds coming into the United States, and they're not shooting at anyone in particular. They're shooting at each other. And the reason they've gone from first, second, third, to fourth generation armored vehicles is because they've learned that mobility is life. When we started, you may be familiar with the big monsters, right, the real heavy ones. Mm. Uh, Most of them were made at the time out of dump trucks just big slabs of metal on them. Today, they have slide-in armor packages in F-150s. So they just go take F-150s from wherever they want, some a lot of from Texas, drive them down there, and then they slide in these custom-made armor packages. And the troop of, Troops of Hell, uh, known as the Troops of Troopers del Inferno, uh, Spanish is terrible there, uh, that's the enforcement wing for CDN. I mean, these, these people are no joke. And if you could see the level of capability they have within what they call the lifeblood of their organizations, which is their communications, you'd be stunned. It's not just encryption. We are so far beyond that. So I tell you those sto- that story like that because the cartels are operating at such a far level than what the American people are being told and impacting us here in the state. Ladies and gentlemen, I could not be more fired up to introduce the presenting sponsor for season two of Change Agents, Montana Knife Company, founded by somebody that I feel very fortunate to call a personal friend, Master Bladesmith, Josh Smith. Not only a Master Bladesmith, but the youngest Master Bladesmith and one of the most experienced in the world. Montana Knife Company blades are some of the finest that I've ever been able to get my hands on. They are the sharpest knife out of the box and they're some of the easiest to resharpen when you dull the blade. I take them everywhere that I go. I have them in every vehicle that I own and every backpack that I ever take into the backcountry. Specifically, my favorite blade of theirs is the Speedgo. It's lightweight, but so incredibly capable. I never leave home without it. If you're familiar with Montana Knife Company, you know it is often very difficult to get one of their blades because they sell out within minutes of being released. What you should be able to find in stock are the Blackfoot 2.0, Speedgo, or a Stonewall Skinner. And if you use the code CHANGEAGENTS10, that's going to net you 10% off of your first order. Again, my personal favorite blade is the Speed Goat. If they have them in stock right now, don't mess around. Put it in your cart and complete the checkout. Montana Knife Company, they build working knives for working people. And like I said at the beginning, I could not be more proud to collaborate with them on Change Agents Season 2.
how are they able to evolve so quickly? You were saying, you know, that they're pulling uh, weapons, equipment, and material from, yeah. you know, kind of corrupt armories. That's one thing. Advanced, uh, you know, boots on the ground, battlefield training, that, that's a different thing. Where Are they just pulling people back who are seasoned, who are just going out and getting in gunfights? Or are they actually sourcing some high-level individuals that are running legitimate training cells for these organizations? So they have been outsourcing people for a very long time. Uh, let's go back to what the Los Zetas were. The Zetas were former GAFE Special Forces. GAFE is the equivalent of U.S. Green Berets. That's really what they are for Mexico, okay? Originally it was a seven, then it was 17, then it went up to about 35, and then ultimately somewhere in the, in, in the 50 range, before, a full-time GAFE that went to work for OCL Cardenas, the head of the Gulf Cartel. So right there, that hub, changed everything and this is what i say was missed by the u.s intelligence agencies because the cart uh the the zetas and the got the guys who originally came over from the got they brought two things to the cartels they brought tradecraft and discipline i want to say that again tradecraft and discipline before that they were dopers you're going to go do a dope deal you're going to buy 10 kilos of cocaine man i'm, I'm an undercover narcotics agent no four you go do that man you, you're going to do a deal at six it goes at you know 10 o'clock or midnight because you're on doper time as we used to call it in the undercover world because they, they're just crooks you know that everything is about yeah we'll get to it when we get to it the zetas were different when the zetas came in you said you were going to be somewhere at six o'clock they were there at five o'clock ready for and prepped and ready to go these people were no joke and with them that's where the, all the discipline and the communications came in that's where they went from open communications into encryption that's where they went into inversion because they knew comms were very, very important. Then they brought in the weaponry. Then they brought in their discipline, and then from that train the trainer programs. So what happened in Mexico, and this was the big miss by the United States intelligence agencies, they were growing so rapidly that every other cartel began to fail because they didn't have these enforcement wings that were this strong. And so it was two options. You either rose to the occasion, you created your own enforcement wings, or you fell. So how did the other cartels do that? Well, they began hiring the FARC. The FARC is, was, until recently, a, for, a designated by the United States State Department foreign terrorist organization. They began hiring Kabiles. Kabiles are Guatemalan special forces. We debriefed many of them who were helping CJNG, Sinaloans, and others for their training. So that level of training, then you had local, state, and federal law enforcement officers from all over coming in. <clears throat> and that's where their trade craft really evolved from. So think of this for a second. We're talking about the cartels who are working and contracting with known terrorists, right? Because that's what the FARC were, guerrilla fighters, known drug traffickers, but also operators. And what that did is it changed the game when the enforcement wings now were forced to rise. So look at the Juarez cartel. They created La Lina. That's the line. The line was known as their enforcement wing. Look at Troops of Inferno. That became what the Zetas when they broke away from the Gulf. That's what they started. Look at Los Anthrax. Los Anthrax was originally um, a cell to protect El Mayo's children, and he was battling others. Now they they rose in, in great strength as an enforcement wing. And the elite group, the Delta group, went in CJ and G, and the list goes on. But this was the great failure by the U.S. intelligence agency. So now you have this capability. It's at a tremendous level. So when I tell you that these people aren't walking around with the Born to Lose tattoo stamped on their forehead, they are no joke. Now, also understand, though, I'm talking about the guys who are the pipe hitters, the old school guys. I'm not talking about these young kids that are on the front lines right now getting killed and whacked every night. I'm talking about people who for the last decade have survived these wars and are very connected with the Mexican government. They are, they are, they are an adversary that should be looked at in the way that they really are. I mean, what you're describing is fascinating to one degree, but also terrifying to another. Um, I mean, I'm the inner cartel violence, I almost want to say it's a good thing that they're spending so much time fighting each other, because if they were to turn that focus towards the United States, I don't think our southern border or the people that are tasked with trying to patrol or control that are probably equipped or manned to deal with that threat. Your border is wide open. Yeah. There, there is no enforcement wing at your border. Americans need to know that right now, the United States Border Patrol is conducting processing operations. That's what they are doing. They are overrun. And this whole lie that the American public is being told 
that your government is conducting a holistic approach. I love it when I hear this. I mean, it just drives me crazy. You know, <laughs> well, if they're conducting a holistic approach, I don't see the CIA down there. I don't see DIA down there. I don't see big numbers of DOD. I see a lot of National Guardsmen activated to conduct operations in Texas, but that's a hold the line. That's not to do the other things. Where is the FBI at their border? They are not supporting Border Patrol in any way, shape, or form. Where is the DEA? Where is HSI? Where is the United States Marshals? The lies told to the American people are tremendous. So I want to be very clear here. Your border is wide open. And so what you say is absolutely right. And look, the cartels have been conducting murders here for many years. I can take you to South Lake, Texas in 2013 when they conducted an execution um, of a Gulf cartel attorney. I can take you to South Texas where they cut the head off of an individual and we had a body floating in the intercoastal. I think it was 2015. And guess who did it? a border patrol agent who was working for the plaza boss of the Gulf cartel. Uh, I could take you to a grandmother uh, and her autistic daughter in Alabama, I'm sorry, granddaughter in Alabama, who were beheaded in 2017 by the Sinaloa cartel. I can take you to uh, what we call the, the uh, eight, an incident 80 miles into the United States, just outside uh, uh, Brackenville, Texas, where you had gunmen in the United States carrying weapons just like you would in Mexico, passing off from one group to another. I can take you to Arizona, where last year you had gunmen who we believe now is, were with the Sinaloa cartel operating between two, driving from Tucson into Phoenix. They passed two Arizona state troopers on Interstate 10, and they're carrying a 50 cal rifle along with an AK an M4, four pistols, fully kitted, and they're filming themselves as a castle because they fear nothing. Th this is what is not getting out. So they have made it here. They are here. And how do you know what I'm saying is true? Look at all the drug distributions throughout this country. They've been contracting, working with U.S.-based gangs for many, many years. Look at now the adjustment from smuggling into the trafficking, and now that is plaguing this whole nation. So they're here. Uh, anytime they want to do what you're, conduct, you're talking about, conduct operations here, they can do it at any time. And they have been. The problem is that the American people aren't being told. I mean, that's that's insane. You're talking about four national military units that are operating with impunity inside of the United States. That's fucking insane. And we are doing nothing to stop it. What kind of uh, influence or sway do these cartels have over the Mexican government? corruption at the highest levels of the Mexican government. They don't want to tell you that. It's the truth. Don't take my word for it. There was a CNN report done, and it was it was really well done. And so for your viewers, you should look this up. The last national election when President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador uh, was uh, elected, they had 132 politicians and staffers killed during that last national election. How many Americans know that? Well, the country's been taken over. And it is a failed state. It is a failed government. The problem is you're not told. If, look, if Mexico, if we, if we switched Afghanistan and Mexico right now, geographically, by location, it, we would consider it a failed state. But because it is right next to our country and it is such a partner in the, in the, in the exchange of commerce, this is why they don't want to talk about it. I have no problem telling you because I know what's coming. I know them very well. They do not care about you. They do not care about their families, your families. They don't care if a city disappears tomorrow. If they're going to move in a cell of terrorists, they do it all the time. How do they do it? They break them up even because I, I know that because I help break some of those cells up. And the trade craft with which they use is tremendous. If they have a group of five, this is a real story. I can't tell you the date because most of this is classified, but I can tell you that they will break up the groups because even though they know that you could lose a city, they're going to pay more money. And so what do they do? They break them up in smaller teams of ones or twos so that if you get, if they, if we capture some of them, we don't capture the whole cell. That tells you the relationship. And listen, what I'm telling you is 10 years old. It's a decade old. Where is the leadership in Washington? Completely missing in action. That's an interesting description of that evolution that reminds me of the evolution of Al Qaeda early on when they used to not very smartly, um, co-locate with larger groups of people and they realized that we were able to find large groups of people so they went backwards with their use of technology and they splintered 
And we drove Al Qaeda from largely Afghanistan. There can be an argument, you know, for people to have on their own as to where they started, how big they were. But it splintered into, I think, somewhere between the low 40s to the low 60s number of countries worldwide. And then it evolved into ISIS, these independently operating cells where you could roll one up. And they wouldn't even have necessarily a lot of information on the other cells because they realized that that compartmentalization allowed them to operate with a larger level of impunity because it didn't really matter if they got rolled up because there were other cells that they may not even know about out there with the same end state and objectives. I mean, that's a it's a very evolved uh, way of thinking about that as an insurgency. It's crazy to think of the parallels of the early global war on terrorism. I, I think that's well said, but I also think too that because you talked a little bit about theory, right, and, and network theory and how the networks operate. I, and I love that. I'll tell you why, because I'm a big believer that we don't fight today's battles and tomorrow's battles the way we did yesterday. And if you look at each cartel, Sinaloans is a great example. You've always heard them as they were led by Chapo Guzman. That was never true. He led his cell, right? Yeah, they called him the capo. That's fine. But he led his cell. And they're really broke up into multiple organizations. And the, those that can really work well with others, if you will, become the biggest. And that's what Sinaloa has become. CJNG is a completely different network and how you go after them. So what I mean by that is that I the, the future of taking them down and the solution to them and ending them is not just going kinetic. It's looking at how they're truly structured and going after what we call the key nodes within that organization. So let's just say you're going after a hub, a spoke, a wheel, or a mesh network. That tells you exactly how you want to go after them. Because you don't have to, you know, it's not zero annihilation. It is take out the capability and you can destroy the organization internally. And that's how we're going to be successful. Now, this, these operations in the future, if we really want to end them, is going to be much more clandestine than it is going to be overt action. Um, if we do it correctly, if the right people are allowed to do what needs to be done, that's how you do it to win. Now, there's going to have to be kinetic operations. You can't even fly over the Sierras where the capos live uh, without having helicopters shot down. So there will have to be some of that, make no doubt. But it will mostly be a unified command model globally of some of the world's best operators, clandestine operators, and we will absolutely decimate them. But we have to do it differently. Anyone, I think, that thinks that we need to do it the way we have traditionally, um, I, I think that that means they don't understand Mexico. I'll give you a great example. You're hearing a lot. Here's where this is coming from. You're hearing a lot out of Washington. We need to use the military to go into Mexico and take out the cartels. That sounds good. Here's the problem with that. There are a lot of people in Mexico that are close friends of ours who are fighting for their nation, fighting for their families, fighting for their lives, who are good people. That is not what they want. That is a bad recipe for failure. There are a lot of great people in Mexico who we can partner with, and I can tell you that as somebody that sent them critical intelligence that has rescued a lot of people and saved a lot of people in Mexico. That's what we need. Uh, under the current president in the United States and the current administration in Mexico, President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, that is not going to happen. But we're in a unique time. Uh, in 2025, we have a unique ability for two new administrations to start afresh, start abroad, and change it all. Give Mexico its peace and give it back to its citizens. And I am very hopeful that we're going to be allowed to do that and that, because I think that that's the right pathway forward. But I will also tell you this. This is not a U.S.-Mexico problem. We need to create a unified command globally, work with our some of the most elite soldiers and clandestine op- operators in the world, and absolutely crush them. That's how we should do it. Can you – you used some uh, words when we were talking about – or you were talking about fentanyl a little bit earlier, the evolution, the different times of uh, types of fentanyl, and then the xylazines. I've never even heard of that. Can you kind of break down that evolution of fentanyl and what it has turned into? Yeah, sure. I, I broke a story in 2020, the time I was writing for Breitbart. And uh, a friend of mine who was with DEA was retiring, and he, he really broke the story wide open that what the Sinaloans had done what, changed the game, specifically the Los Chapito cell of the Sinaloans, which is the sons of Chapo Guzman, led by Ivan Guzman. Even though in the news they told you a video Guzman was the high, biggest drug trafficker out there, that was all – Wrong, by the way, just so everyone knows, a video who was just extradited in the United States is like the drunk uncle. I mean, he's a bottom <laughs> feeder of us. I mean, it's the lies that you're told. It's just, it's insanity to me. But anyway, um, 
he broke the story, uh, or he gave me the information, allowed me to break the story just after he had retired that the Sinaloans, the, the sons, had hired about 16 to 18 chemists originally, right out of universities in Mexico. And their job was to change the analogs in the creation and the and, uh, and they did that for two reasons. One is that at the time, the Trump administration was really going hard on China. And so they were trying to stop the chemical precursors from coming in. And a lot of what was being mailed into the United States through the U.S. Postal Service to stop that. So they did. And what the, the Mexicans knew, the, the cartels knew, is that if that happened, that that was going to lock them down. So what they began doing immediately was working with Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh to import chemical precursors. So what are you told today? China, 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 overlaid with more China. They've already adjusted around that. And so what these chemists did was they began changing how you manufacture fentanyl, but also making more deadly strains of it. Most of what we see here in Texas right now is parafentanyl. So it goes regular fentanyl, then parafentanyl, then serafentanyl. Now we're mixing xylazine into it. Xylazine is a tranquilizer known as trank on the streets. It is a deadly, deadly batch of tranquilizer that's mixed in with fentanyl and why the question your audience needs to understand is well why because i get asked this question all the time jason why would the cartels want to kill their own uh their own people that they're trying making the money it's their customer why would they want to do that they don't care please hear me they do not care about you you are one economy of so many around the world that they're working with. The problem is you haven't been told. They don't give a shit if they kill off everybody. And from their standpoint, this is very, very important. From their standpoint, they do not fear the United States government. They do not fear the Mexican government. What they fear when you sit down and you talk to them is their rivals. So they have to make a more deadlier batch because if the rival makes a better batch of fentanyl, and they sell more of it, then they can have enough money to overtake them. So from their pers- it's the same reason why they went from first generation to second generation armored vehicles. It's the first, it's the same reason why when the first uh, car bomb kicked off in 2010 in Juarez, why by the end of the year, we had four other cartels now using car bombs uh, created by Tovex. By the way, the detonation device on the first one was a FARC detonator. That's where they, they acquired the, the trade craft from it. Uh, and, and so it can't stop. And if you talk to them, they will tell you that. The problem is no one's telling the American people this. So I'm screaming on national television. We got problems. We got problems. This isn't going to get better. And the Washington is lost. They just look at these people as drug traffickers. So that's the, the when you hear the term weaponization of fentanyl, that is it. It's real. It is not a joke. And it will continue to get worse. And within the zine categories, you have four others that are going to be coming online within the next three years. Trank is the first, and now you have a whole other series. Why isn't DEA telling you this? They know it. They're the ones that briefed me on it privately because their leadership doesn't want you to know. What do they want you to think? China, China, China. And I'm not taking away from China. China is a major problem in this. They are the best at um, non-conventional warfare. So this is playing to their benefit, and I'm not taking away from that problem set, but I am trying to be very clear here because you're going to be told if we just do an embargo and we stop the ships coming in from China, we're going to stop the supply, and it it sounds right. It makes sense. But when you look at the capabilities of the cartels and how they're already operating with all of these other players, they've already gone around all of that. The problem is that the American people aren't told, so I'm, I'm getting it out. I don't give a shit who I piss off anymore. Left, right, up or down. I just left bombs in Washington, D.C. at the Lost Voices of Fentanyl. You want to be humbled in your life? I briefed a lot of families. That the one, people they love the most in the world are never coming home. Listen to these moms' stories. We got moms that are losing two children in one night because they go to the same party. They take a pill that they think is Xanax, and it's fentanyl pills. Yeah. I listened to a mom who lost her three-year-old son, Gage, walking on carpet and what do babies do they put their hands in their mouth <coughs> Killed them. and i could do this one these one-offs so when i tell you that uh i'm all in man on this we should all be because this will not get better well that's terrifying i had not heard of those other variations of fentanyl let alone the xylazines 
the the stories that I have heard from people were accidental exposure, very similar to what you talked about. They're at a party, kids, young men and women doing what some men and young women do, experimenting. They sure. don't. They're not trying to yeah. get their hands on fentanyl, but I, to my knowledge, at least locally, it hasn't been any of those other variations. But they're still dying. I can't even fathom the impact if it is increasing in its lethality and effectiveness. Uh, yeah, I don't want to see that at all. That's terrifying. Well, that see, that's the story that's not getting out too. So here's another. Let me let me add a whole other problem set to this. I think it's much worse than what the CDC is revealing to the American people. And the reason is, I gave you data about the 111,355 yep. overdose really poisonings. We we have to call them overdoses because that's what the CDC does. But they're poisonings from April to April, right? Why April to April? Why we are in October? Why am I not giving you stats from last month? Because the system is so outdated and how pathologists draw the blood, make the determination, and then send the, the final. The numbers, bodies are backed up so long. We're at April. That's the latest data set. We are six to nine months behind what the real data trends are. So when I tell you 111,000, please understand me. I'm telling you from April. By the time you get to October, we may very well be another couple of thousand ahead. Do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah. We've never been here before. And it, I'm, look, I'm a big believer on data. I, I, I don't care what I think or what I feel. If the data tells me otherwise, I follow it. If you look at CDC data going back to 1960, when they first began cr keeping, keeping track of overdoses in the country, in the 80s, many of us remember the uh, crack epidemic in this country. We were only averaging about 10,000 at the height of that in the late 80s in overdoses. So when I tell you that we are truly in a whole different ball game, this is the weaponization of fentanyl. It is no joke. It is no joke when we see it and what is happening in communities. And, I, and I'll tell you one more thing too. I really believe now after um, my travels across the country, visiting with families, especially on the east and the northern west coast, I think it's going to be the fentanyl crisis in this country that changes what we do with the cartels versus the border policies. I really do. Families are just being devastated by this right now. I, I agree with you on that, especially for people who don't live in a state that is proximal to the border, so they don't actually experience it. But you can't ignore the things that are happening in your backyard. And if the lethality of this stuff... I mean, what you're talking about. I hadn't thought about that. The overdose levels from the the crack epidemic. I mean, we're already talking about an 11x increase of that. If it's a you know 10 versus 110,000, probably still climbing at a, at a rocket scale, looking like an Elon Musk rocket going into orbit. There's no way to ignore that. I mean, that's going to start impacting families. And as as horrible as it is to say. I've never met more motivated people than who have experienced avoidable tragedy in their life. I think it would actually light a fire under them, unfortunately, through the lens of tragedy that actually could course correct what's going on at the border. I agree with you. I don't I think, think it would right. be the border policy. What? Uh, talk to me. You brought it up briefly, the wristbands. Talk to me about this debt bondage. Broke the story in February of 2021. Uh, I just testified before Congress about six weeks ago, and I held those up in my hand, and I said, what you're witnessing right now is America's new slave trade. And what happened was, is just as U.S. Border Patrol was overwhelmed based on the policies of the administration with people pouring into the country, so were the cartels. And Cartel de Gop, also known as CDG, or the Gulf Cartel that operates from Brownsville, Texas, or really Matamoros, just on the other side of Brownsville, all the way over to Miguel Aleman, which is right across from Roma, Texas, several hundred miles there, a river frontage, uh, prime real estate for the smuggling into the United States. Uh, they began putting wristbands on men, women, and children because what they figured is, uh, my God, there are so many coming, and we can charge so much money. This is a game changer. You know, in the old days to cross the southern border in South Texas at that river, they'd usually charge you about $100, and it was just a smuggler who's going to charge you to cross they didn't care where you came from. None of that mattered. They're just going to charge you from point A to point B, give you an inner tube. You can row across because a lot of a lot of migrants can't swim. And then they actually put it on a rope and they pull that thing back. And they didn't give a shit where you went, right? That's human smuggling. From paying a person to go from point A to point B. And when you get to point B, that transaction is done and you move on about your life and so do the organizations. 
Today, that has shifted. Now, we're into debt bondage. Well, what is that? When we talk of human trafficking, most Americans are familiar with the commercial sex, mm -hmm. right? That's the first of three within the human trafficking realm. You then fall into forced labor, and then from there, you fall into what's called debt bondage. So now, the cartel saw all these people crossing, and they said to themselves, my God, we can make this, and this was told to me by a lieutenant within the Gulf Cartel, we can make this the gift that keeps giving. Here's what they mean by that. Because as a commodity, as a human, you can tell that commodity exactly what to do, and you can make it pay for years to come if you want. So now, if you want to cross that border in Gulf Cartel territory, what they did is they began taking all of your PII data, what we call personal identifying information. Most migrants have a cell phone, just so everybody knows, even though you're not told that either. So when they cross, they go directly, or before they cross, they go directly into a stash house right at the border. And this was in, when, it, when it was first started. And they take all their information from their country of origin, mom, dad's name, home where they grew up, sister, brother, et cetera. Leverage. And they decide, okay, we got enough. There you go. Now, where are you going in the United States? Here's where I'm going. Who are you going to stay with? Give me their number. Is this, do you know such and such? Yes, I do. What's their name? What's the number? What's your number? What's the address? They validate it. Once they validate it, now that agreement has been made. That went into their computer. And then from there, a negotiation was set up where you were going to pay. So if you were Mexican at the time, it was $2,500 just across that river. Just the river. Then they changed it for Central Americans, 3000 And then for Chinese, 5000 for Russians and Middle Eastern, nine grand. None of them have this money. So now they are in debt. So what do they do? They give them a wristband. They tell them as soon as you cross into the United States, and when I say you, meaning we tell you when to cross, they, the cartels cross them on boats. I've got video of it. I've been right there with the smugglers from me to this cactus behind me, and I'm filming them. As soon as they get off, you watch them. They rip the wristband. I've seen a wristband on a 10-day-old child. As soon as the wristband hits the ground, they walk right, right to Border Patrol. As soon as they get to Border Patrol, they tell them where they want to go, they get processed, and based on what the administration is doing, they then send them throughout the country wherever they wanted to go. Here's the problem. Yet they're here for years, if not decades to come, but yet in debt to a terrorist organization, really should be a terrorist organization, in a foreign country. We have never been here before. So when I tell you that we are witnessing America's new slave trade, it's exactly what's happened. And for the Gulf Cartel, it has been a win-win. It's taken Cartel de la Este much longer to get on board with this and many of the others. But what CDG did was brilliant. It's a brilliant model for making money. So you hear all the time, you know, billions of dollars, billions of dollars. Yeah, that's all true. They're making a lot of money. But the damage to us domestically is going to be tremendous because many of these people, most of them are economic migrants. Most are good people, um, are coming here for good reasons, but they don't have, they don't have skills. So if they can't make their monthly or bi-weekly payment, what are they going to do? They're going to sell dope. They're going to burglarize homes. They're going to go into prostitution. That's exactly what we're seeing domestically here in Texas. You're going to feel it in the North, where in the North you historically feel that, through the, the problem from the border through the lens of overdose poisonings. In the South, we traditionally feel it through smuggling and trafficking. Now, what I, what I call the uh, great convergence has now taken place. We now feel your overdose deaths in the South. You're feeling the smuggling and trafficking in the North. It's happened. But that was the process they created. And what was amazing to me, because I, I monitor what I call the daily tripwires of these organizations. Do you know within six weeks, six weeks, it had spread from one alien smuggling organization to another 36 miles, all working, all alien smuggling organizations working for the Gulf Cartel, because now they can keep track. The efficiency and, and speed by which transnational crime moves would stun the American people. That's why we failed for 60 years in drug trafficking. The problem is that Americans weren't told. You were always told what? Ah, if you just didn't have a drug problem, the supply and demand issue wasn't there. Ah, but we didn't have a fentanyl crisis in this country. It was created. The problem is nobody tells you the real truth of what's been happening. That's why I just finally have said I've had it and I'm coming out and I still can't believe I'm doing this seven years later. I never thought we'd be here. Man. What you're talking about with that level of uh, sophistication, the ability, you know, the database, the, their vetting, 
the locations and the known contacts of these people. You want to talk about an immense amount of leverage that will do exactly what you described. People will do whatever they have to do to not allow their family members to be the victimized, you know, the victims of them falling short on one of those payments. It doesn't surprise me that they would choose uh, crime or whatever they could to fulfill those things. I mean, that's a that's a level of sophistication in and of itself in the organization, but it also sounds to me like it's planting the seeds. I mean, if you truly wanted to infiltrate a country and have a long-term impact, you would do it slowly like that. You would plant the seeds, you would water them, and at some point the the fertilized ground would no longer be able to hold back the the new growth. And if we don't pay attention as a country, it sounds like that's exactly what's going to happen. No, absolutely. And, you know, look, if if they can't reach them here, they just go reach them in Honduras, in Guatemala, in Central and South America, where their families are, and they hold them accountable that way. So they've got them on both ends. It's not just one or the other. Yeah. Um, there's a problem that's going to – listen, I'll, I'll say it now, and I want you to remember you and I had this conversation in five years. <sighs> the human trafficking in, in this country will be at epidemic levels. And we have to remember, and we have to be very open and honest with the level of failure here. People will tell you we've always had human trafficking in this country. Bullshit. We didn't even have human trafficking on the books in Texas until 2001. I think for the national – for the federal government until 2004. Hmm. So – don't let the lies, because you have a lot of people who want to work human trafficking will say, well, it's always been here. And they want to make, you know, every person who's working commercial sex voluntarily a prostitute, a victim. And they are. I'm not I'm not taking away from any of that. So for all the haters out there, it is what it is. But when I tell you that you're in debt bondage and you're being forced to do things against your will, we're in a whole new game here with human trafficking, whole new game. And so what we have. So when people say to me, oh, Jason, we've always had this. I come back immediately because the law book shows otherwise, we were protected by our oceans. And now because of the failed border policies, the world's problems are hitting us. And we feel it, Americans know it. Uh, the problem is all these little ideologues that are on television continue to tell you the same thing and we're rinse, wash and repeat it. And that's, it's unfortunate, but you know, we've got to have people who've been in the fight for a long time. time. It's time to start speaking the truth and getting it out. It sounds like you've had some pretty interesting conversations with members of these cartels. How open are they about their organization and their beliefs? You would be surprised. Many of them, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a great story. Had a uh, had an accountant within the Zetas come to us and gave a flash drive of all the money, all the accounts, everything he had access to. And he was screaming at us, saying, you've got to act as the United States government. You have to act we're out of control mexico is failing this was 2014 2015 i guess before i retired in 2016 and i think about that now quite a bit i mean a lot because the damage to the mexican people you know we talk about our country but you got to remember mexico has been dealing with this for a very long time just so your audience knows they they have lost over two i mean 340,000 mexican citizens according to their own data in Mexico. Now you need to know anyone that gives you data on deaths in Mexico, it's not correct. I wanna be very clear that it's much higher, but that's what's reported through the Mexican government, okay? So the numbers are much higher. The other thing you need to remember is that the cartels have a saying, and that is that you can't count a body that doesn't exist, which is why they give so bodies. That count, according to their data, is at 110,000 since 2007. So the numbers are much, much higher. And I didn't include that in the 340,000 um, that are dead. Those are missing is what they titled them as the, the 110,000. So the numbers are much higher. Where I'm going with that is that the Mexican people have been impacted tremendously by what's been taking place in Mexico. The problem is we're not told and aware. And you have to remember, too, you know, if look at all a great example of, of this failure is look at all of the journalists who have been killed in mexico a lot of right a lot so when they try to report the tragedies they try to report what's really been taking place or killed man i i have a feeling and hope actually that this episode will scare the shit out of people which will lead them to asking the question what can i do and i think the quite i mean you're the expert on the answer for sure on this but i feel like geographically 
the answer would probably change. Do you live in a northern state? Do you live in a state that that borders the U.S. southern border? Where what would you what would you say to people like Jason? Holy shit, you just scared the crap out of me. I want to educate myself more. I want to do something to either force our government to treat these cartels for what they are or to help the victims of these cartels. Where do you point people? I point them to the people who represent them. And I, I hate having to do that, but I do. And I'll explain to you why. This problem set is so big that states can't take it on alone. I mean, look at Texas as a great example. They spent $10 billion for Operation Lone Star. Still not near enough. And that's just to, to try to stop the crime wave that's <laughs> impacting. So states, for the long run, strategically, states cannot be the whipping boy of the federal government any longer. States have got to rise and step up and start taking action against this. Uh, the crime wave that's hitting us is tremendous. What I would tell Americans right now that are watching you got to change who's in office and you got to demand that they're going to designate these cartels as foreign terrorist organizations. You have to. And the reason for that, the real core reason for that is that this has gone so far beyond a law enforcement only mission. And what the terrorism designation gives us, and if your elected leaders don't go for this, we are never going to get better because our system by design, the reason we've got 50 plus years of failure against the border issue and then what's happening in Mexico is our system was never designed to take on the world's problems. It moves very slow under our Fourth Amendment. And we want it that way as Americans, because if the government targets us, we want to make sure they cross every T and dot every I. And I have had to work that. And look, that's what we want. But when you go against transnational crime, it moves very, very rapidly, It moves very quickly. So with the terrorism designation, if you can get your elected officials to vote for the terrorism designation, here's what you get. Here's why you need to do it. First, we have tens of thousands of them throughout our nation in every major city in every state. Most of them are here on visas. Remember, they have money. They can afford them. It allows us to revoke their visas very rapidly because you can't be a terrorist in our country and I can get them back in their country. I don't have to spend $100,000 of your money for a two-year investigation. I'm putting speed into the system, basically. Second, You always hear, we need to go after their money. We need to go after their assets. Well, no shit. I mean, we've been doing that for 20 years. The problem is what you're not told is that through an investigative model, our system moves very slow by design. So with the terrorism designation, now I can seize assets globally and I can go after their money real time. Third, now I can limit their mobility because if you're a terrorist, you can't be on, uh, you're on no fly list Mm -hmm. and I can stop their movements via shipping. So what am I doing? I'm limiting their mobility to Mexico. I'm degrading their capability using tools of national power. I'm using network theory to absolutely crush them and take away their capabilities to allow the Mexican government to now come in and be able to manage them. That's what I'm looking to do. I'm not looking to go to war. I'm not looking to create a nation state. And that's what you need to tell your elected leaders who continue to say the wrong thing. Ah, we just need to get more money for Border Patrol. Border Patrol does not go after the cartels. That is not what they do. They are there to protect you at your border. Currently, right now, all they're doing is processing. Those are administrative things that need to change. But if your elected officials do not give us the tools of national power to go after these cartels, what you are getting today, get ready. The 111,355 dead from April of 23 to April of 22 is just the beginning. If you don't believe me, just look south at what's happening to Mexican citizens and migrants, because it is coming here, America. It is coming here. Jason, I'm going to let you close it out. What do you want to leave people with? I want to leave you with this, and that is that this is absolutely fixable. Don't let anyone tell you this isn't fixable. But as Americans, we are going to have to get tough. And I mean goddamn tough, because these people that we're up against, they are no joke. They have been slaughtering people in Mexico for a long time, and they've been collaborating with the other underground networks all over the world. But it is absolutely fixable. And don't let anyone tell you that it's not. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to build a unified command of the best world's operators all over the world. We're going to partner with Mexico. We're going to get the tools and authorities that we need. We're going to destroy these labs in Mexico. And we are absolutely going to crush the cartels. And I want you to understand something. When we're done, there's not going to be a place on planet Earth where they can hide for what they've done to your families what they've done for Mexican families and the families all over the world. We are going to absolutely eviscerate them. 
but it won't be the way you remember it. It won't be in the public media, but you will know it's happening. I promise you. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. I actually, if I'm being honest, hope that this week's episode scared you. I hope that it puts you deep into thought and I hope that it drives you to want to learn more about what's going on at our border, the impact that the cartels have, and the work that people like Jason are doing. If you want to learn more about Jason and the work that he is continuing to do post-retirement, you can visit his website at jasonjones.com. Now, I'm going to spell that for you because his first name is a little atypical in the spelling. It's J-A-E-S-O-N Jones, J-O-N-E-S.com. That's jasonjones.com. Thank you again for listening to Change Agents, an ironclad original presented by Montana Knife Company. We'll be back next week with an all-new episode.